G'day and welcome to Choosing You. I'm Rob Malicki coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. Thanks for your company. And my guest today is Kira Sheridan from Deakin University. She's studying a Bachelor of Environmental Science in Wildlife and Conservation, which is an awesome topic, Kira, because I started off in the same degree at Macquarie University many, many moons ago. So you wow. teach it those really well. <laughs> yeah. How good is this? Oh. Yeah, it's awesome. It was an awesome course. And I understand you've just done something pretty, pretty exciting as part of that degree in the last couple of months. Tell me about that. I did. Starting in November over December, I went on a three-week study tour with Deakin. It was for one of my final units. And we went to Borneo, Malaysian Borneo in particular. We went to Sarawak. And over those three weeks, I was able to go into some amazing communities and meet people from, I mean, from locals to just to like official sort of people. And we got to, I guess, learn about how environmental issues are approached and the way that they're impacted by different loads of different things like development in particular yeah it was it was really really awesome for getting i guess a different perspective from what we're used to here i mean from everything i know of borneo this is like environmental students dream kind of yeah right? yeah absolutely it's like it's home to something like six percent of the world's foreign fauna so oh, it's very important and it, it's also one of like because it's, it's in particular because there are a lot really really large export of palm oil which yeah. we've seen all throughout media and stuff about i guess how bad its impact has been but we did get to get i guess a different perspective and how development you know in some ways has been in a lot of ways it has been negative, but there has been also some really great positive stuff for the local communities and op new opportunities. It was awesome, especially after two years, two plus years of being, you know, in a COVID world. I, it was so exciting to get back out and be, you know, it really proved why I'm so passionate about, about the environment and about its education and communication and, yeah, I was super duper lucky to be one of a 16 students that went on that trip with uh, two of our professors and yeah, an awesome time, an awesome time. Tell me more about, about where that passion came from, passion for the environment. I think I've, I've always had, I've always loved the environment. I've loved being outside and I would say I can really, you know, pinpoint that when probably it was in year nine, my outdoor ed teacher, I remember she said this thing to me. She said she didn't want kids. And I didn't understand that at the time. And I was like, why? And she's like, because I don't want my kids to grow up in a world without polar bears. And I never really understood that. But I went on and, you know, it was when, you know, after doing this course and learning the things that I've learned, I've been like, wow, like I know what she means. It's our environment has changed and world has changed so much and it's, you know, rapidly declining. And if we don't do something about it and, if, you know, there isn't going to be anything left for the future generations. And that's, that's sad because, you know, I feel really lucky to have seen the things that I've seen so far, even though I'm so young and I don't want, I, I the environment, yeah, it's just, Oh, it's such a heavy thing because like most of the time you tend to feel, especially studying what I'm studying, you tend to feel a bit pessimistic about it all because the world is dying and it's getting really hard to be able to ever repair the damage that we as humans have done where we are the problem. What's your thought on like, so for you, because it's a huge problem, right? And there, yeah. there are different ways that we can step in to try and try and attack that. Um, there's the education side, there's obviously mm -hmm. the pure science side, there's the advocacy and the policy side. Where do you fall? Where do you feel like you're heading in terms of the place you want to make impact? Definitely communications and education. Mm -hmm. I think everything, everything starts with that. If we go back, you know, in history, all, all the problems of the world have come to communication mm -hmm. and that lack of, and it's, we or, really, or manipulation, or, or manipulation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the misinformation, like, so, like stuff like social media, has been so so important for sharing just how you know important the environment is. And I, I mean, a plethora of like of different topics. It's been really really great in that aspect. It's also you know spread so much hate, and especially with there being so many, I found that there's a lot of barriers to um, 
proper science communication, environmental education, and where you have people in, you know, in countries like like Malaysia, like all throughout the Indo-Pacific, they're the ones that are the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And but they're also the ones that are not actually, I guess, properly being told about it, whether it's from the government, you know, the government just, I guess, kind of, you know, the manip manipulation of some people and just not, it's, yeah, it's a real problem with accessibility and I really want to improve that. I want to you know, change how things are and I really think I, I have that passion to do it. I will say one of my, you know, a major, major inspiration for me has been David Attenborough. I mean, who who doesn't love him? He's He's been very, very, very important in changing, I guess, the narrative of the environment from, you know, it's not just a resource. It's something that was here first and will be here when we're gone and without the proper protection, without caring about it and knowing how amazing it is, it's going to be gone. And that's, yeah, it's, it's really sad. <laughs> So stepping into your degree, mm -hmm. when you started that program, what struck you most about that sort of first year of courses at university on wildlife and conservation? Is there something that really stood out to you in terms of courses? And that can let's be really specific, like Deakin University and that particular program. What kind of jumped out at you? Honestly, I will say that probably the the first two years of my degree, and my degree was three years. I, I only just finished in trimester three, so only recently. And I don't remember a whole, like, you know, I don't remember a whole, a whole lot. I guess I was still, because, you know, I think being online, it did make it fairly difficult. And I think Deacon did really well with, I guess, trying to give us, in particular, the environmental, you know, sector of Deacon and CB. They tried really hard to make it as, you know, teach us as much as they could. But in reality, our course is very, very practical. Um, you can't just learn things on a screen. You have to do it. I think the thing that did, stand out i guess I, I when i started my course i didn't really know what you know avenue i wanted to go down uh, i just knew i loved the environment and i loved wildlife and i just wanted to be involved but as it got through my first year into my second year i think i did that's where the communication sort of passion came in i was like that was the one main thing that stood out amongst everything and as we because my the base subjects we just kind of learned about you know biology and all it was the you know when we began to learn about the problems and stuff all that stem all that connected to this idea of education communications and were I those, was obviously sorry were those courses taught by science educators and by the science faculty or is this is this like the communications people business sort of people side of people that are teaching into a science degree. So all of them, yeah, were from CB, from the science and environmental uh, faculty. There wasn't any, I only did in my second year, I did a science communication elective, which they've just recently actually changed and improved my course just as I've left. And they've included really, really important sections to it, like Indigenous education, so which important. is super important. And super I, important. I did do two electives during my degree through another, I guess, part of the uni but now it's actually you know in it's integrated into the course there's more opportunities for communication science communication in particular throughout the course as well so there's some really great improvements that there but yeah everything's coming from some really great and knowledgeable people who have been in you know in the field from anywhere from a couple of years to you know, 20 plus years. And I learned a lot from all of them. Why, out of curiosity, why did you choose Deakin? I mean, there's a lot of good unis in Melbourne with some excellent science programs. What made you choose Deakin as a uni? Well, after in year nine, I went to a open day and I went to an information, as I said, I always loved the environment. So I was, I went into an information session, sat down and I heard these two professors, John, John White and Raylene, talk about, Raylene Cook, talk about this Borneo study tour. Hmm. Um, in year nine, this Borneo study tour. Yep, yep. In <laughs> okay. a study tour to Borneo, and I was like, "I'm going to do that. Uh, that wow. is awesome. I'm going to do that trip because it just sounds so interesting to me. And it was something, you know, I'd seen, I'd seen all this awesome wildlife and environments in David Attenborough documentaries, but it's never something you you think you'll see in real life. And from that point on, I was like, I'm 
going to do this course, I'm going to do this trip, and I'm going to go to Deakin. I actually ended up putting uh, on my VTAB application. Deakin do a really, really great job with the abroad program and the international opportunities. And that was also one of the things which really drew me to them because Deakin recognised the importance of going overseas and getting those different perspectives and developing that cultural knowledge and relationships with people from overseas because it's very, very important in our careers, especially as an environmental scientist and communicator, you need to be aware of the world and you need to be aware of the different people and how, you know, they understand things. And I, yeah, it was really, um, I guess, from there that I was like so determined to get into this uni and I did. I also got a, a scholarship with that when I got into the uni, which was a, to, it was a $3,000 grant to sort of um, go towards an abroad program. And cool. I was only able to use that with the um, study tour last year. I had a lot of intention to do uh, international trips every single year of my degree, nice. but COVID. unfortunately, yeah. But I think Borneo, being able to go to Borneo and I sitting there and reflecting on it, I just, after if something like you know it was 2016 like six years later being able to go on the trip and one of 16 people when i know i think over like 100 100 students over second and third years applied for it wow. i got to be one of those lucky people to do what i'd set out to do it was life-changing the best thing i've i've ever done and what i love about this yeah. i mean it's so, such a valuable experience right and i really believe with university that the academic side of things, you know, what you do in a classroom is no more than 50% of the whole experience. Obviously, you've got Absolutely. knowledge you need to learn and skills mm -hmm. that you might need to learn, but so much of the rest of the experience, so much of what is powerful on a resume, what tells a story, or sorry, that tells a story on your resume, Yeah, uh, is all this other stuff, you know, this experience that is clearly so vivid in your mind, but mm -hmm. then has driven so much change in you. And then you add in that, like, you know, being involved in clubs and societies and leadership program and De Deacon's fantastic for they all are, the curricular are. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've had the best time at Deacon, and I've got, like I've got three jobs with them. I'm doing three jobs with huh. them at the moment. So they're also providing me money. So what do they do? So tell me that. What are you doing? What are you working? On? My first job with Deacon was the Deacon Engagement and Access Program. I'm a mentor for them, and basically they are a program dedicated for years nine to twelve. Really, really focus on the importance of education, showing them because we kind of steered towards the low socioeconomic schools, and it's trying to show these kids that there's you know they don't need to drop out of school. What would you say to you know if you're talking with a student from a low SES place, maybe? Family, no one in the family's ever been to uni before. What would you say? That they can do whatever they set their mind to. And just because they think there's barriers in like money, like family, so many different things that can be involved, even stuff, disability. There, if you're passionate about something and you really truly believe in doing it and you care about it you can do that that's the main our main aim of deep is really focusing on pushing them towards their their careers and and making them want to do more than just staying in this one place their whole lives yeah showing the options that, that are there which is super awesome recently i also this year i then also started my deacon ambassador job for orientation so cool. campus tours and then finally I'm working with the Navigate program with Deakin which is I'm a mentor again working with first years, first year autistic students or students with autism just sort of helping them navigate their way through their first year of uni because transitioning to uni is tough and it's new and different and yeah when there's so many other things going on I, sometimes you just need someone and so I'm really excited for that to begin as well. Clearly, you're a very caring and supportive person. Where, yeah. Where, where did that come from? Yeah, I don't know. I think I am very lucky growing up. My parents have always been my biggest supporters and they've always, you know, pushed me and, and they've let me do all these amazing things. Like from a young age, my family lives in Ireland, so I was always able to go on these overseas trips and I got the travel bug. And in high school, I was able to go to, I think, three countries on trips with school and... They've always allowed me to do things that I'm, I care about, which I've been really, really, really fortunate about. I think also 
recently one of the major things that have made me who I am now is in November of 2021 uh, I was diagnosed with narcolepsy which is a chronic sleep disorder ca- particularly characterized by overwhelming daytime drowsiness and mm-hmm. I particularly struggle with brain fog and a lack of concentration and I think that's probably been going on since about year eight but I never actually had a name to it or a diagnosis until the end of 2021 which wow. is crazy because it's I think I was always told oh you're just burning yourself out like there's nothing you know there's nothing wrong and it's it was really tough getting the diagnosis because like wow like something is you know there is something but not necessarily wrong with me because I don't look at it in that way anymore but it was positive in the way that I was like it had you know I finally knew what it was and I was like I can you know there's things I can do to treat it somewhat there's not really any cures or anything yet but having a name to I was like yeah okay I know what it is let's go from there it was pretty I guess devastating though hearing that it's going to get worse and has gotten progressively worse I would say especially looking at like in high school I was I was always very a high achieving kid and my doctor did say to me that like, I don't know how you passed year 12 with narcolepsy um, but it's go looking at that of how I could concentrate fairly well and it wasn't as hard to do things as it is now. It's it's really, really difficult because I, I cannot concentrate on things and it takes me, you know, it can take me hours sometimes to write one sentence. But I think it's that that really showed me, you know, how, I guess in some ways how short life is. And I also, have, I've always, always wanted to prove myself to everyone even when there's no need for it you know I've always wanted to be more for myself and for others and I think hearing about having this diagnosis this disability I wanted to show others want to show others that there you again if you're passionate about something you can do anything and people you know might say there's these limitations and they might put limitations on you but yeah I'm a real real advocate for as everything I've spoken about, breaking down these barriers and, and inspiring others and, and being a voice and, you know, helping achieving, you know, achieving my goals and dreams despite all of that. I've, you know, showing people that you can do it, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, Kira. It's very personal. My guest today has been Kira Sheridan from Deakin University studying Bachelor of Conservation and Wildlife. And we've had an awesome conversation. It's been super nice to connect with you, Kira. Thank I'm you super so much. looking forward to following along with your adventures over the next couple of years. I do have a last question. As mm-hmm. you've been chatting, popping in and out of screen on the right hand side, you've got this cool is that a, I don't know if it's a tat or it's just a drawing. <laughs> it's a tattoo. I've got like Oh you got 70, a few Yeah, I got like 70 plus tattoos. Oh wow, um, fuck. That's <laughs> that's an accumulation. Awesome. Yeah. What's, what's this what's this little guy here? Um, yeah he's a little just a little devil dude i got him on a beach in bali um which probably not the best thing oh to get a best place to get a tattoo but it's about the the memory and the experience why do you you love the tats (laughs) they feel like they're like and you can see my personality through them like every single one even though they didn't initially have like a meaning behind them they do now and i can you know i can connect something about me to that it also just makes me look cooler (laughs) <laughs> well, Kira, it's been awesome chatting with you. Thanks for sharing your experiences. And I look forward to seeing how everything unfolds in Malaysia in the next couple of years. Good on you. Thank you. And for those of you, if you're listening at home, watching at home, heaps more resource and information on the Choosing Your Uni website, choosingyouruni.com, videos, independent advice. My only goal is to try and help you find the thing, that next step that's going to work for you. So check out that website and drop me a comment in any of my resources. I love getting back to you. Have yourself an awesome day. Take it easy, Kira. Thanks. Bye.